Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Our subject this morning is the economics of legal tender law. This sounds like a fairly arcane subject, but as I will try to demonstrate, it is not. The context is uh, that today we have in all countries a monetary system uh, characterized by two essential features. One is the, the presence of a central banking system. But what is more important here is not that um, we have central banks, but that these central banks are in fact producers of a particular type of money, namely immaterial fiat money. The second characteristic feature is the presence of, central, of uh, fractional reserve banking. So the question is, uh, why do we have this kind of monetary system? How did it come about? In former times, until the 17th century approximately, uh, monetary system in Western countries, but also in all other countries, uh, did not have these features. Rather, we had um, a money system based on a commodity money, particular precious metals, silver essentially, but also gold to some extent. And fractional reserve banks did exist here and there occasionally, but uh, they did not play the central role that they've come to play in our present monetary system. So the question then is why the former system has been abandoned and why has fractional reserve uh, banking become so important? Most economists believe that the transition has resulted from uh, advantages of this, of this new system. Right? So these advantages can, for example, be uh, greater efficiency and lower cost. Lower cost was the argument of the classical economists, mercantilist economists, and uh, today the Keynesian economists, and also some Visarian Austrian economists, believe that uh, uh, fiat money, fiat, material fiat money, and uh, uh, in particular fractional reserve banking, are more efficient economic institutions, and that therefore they have proven their efficiency in the market process, in a competitive process, they have just driven out less efficient institutions. I will argue in my present talk that uh, the transition did not result from such advantages, but from a political process of uh, monetary interventions, and uh, that the transition therefore essentially resulted from the imposition of legal tender laws. Legal tender laws play a very important role in this transition, this transformation across time of our monetary system, and therefore the arcane subject of legal tender laws becomes suddenly more interesting. So how do we define a, a legal tender law? A legal tender law forces the citizens to accept the money chosen by the government, so this we call legal tender, for the settlements of all their financial obligations. Um, that's what you find, for example, on US dollar notes. I don't know whether you've ever considered it in more detail, so it's written on the, on the greenback that uh, this note is legal tender for all debt, public and private. And uh, uh, the, the crucial thing now is that this law um, applies to overrule private contracts uh, that stipulate payments in terms of other monies. So even if we make a, a payment, let's say, that stipulates a payment in euros or in silver coins or in gold coins, the legal tender law means that uh, our debtor, or if we are the debtor, then we can insist on paying back money that we owe or any payment that we owe in terms of gold, silver, euros, Swiss francs, and so on in US dollars. And the creditor can do nothing about this. Such a law in practice then uh, uh, requires the definition of a fiat exchange rate that the government not only has to define what the legal tender is, but in case uh, the legal tender is newly introduced into the market, um, the government also has to define what is the exchange rate as compared to the prevailing uh, monies that are being used or money substitutes that are being used, that is the, uh, those uh, media of exchange that the market participants have spontaneously chosen. Our lecture uh, will uh, proceed in four steps. We shall first consider the, the basic law that uh, helps us to understand the economic consequences of legal tender laws, and this is Gresham's law. And then see how uh, Gresham's law explains how government interventions through legal tender laws have ruined the coinage in the past. 
and have thereby already promoted fractional reserve banking, but how legal tender laws then can also be used to more directly promote fractional reserve banking. And finally, we we'll, shall see how uh, the transition occurs from fractional reserve banking to fiat money. All of this is explained uh, in some more detail in uh, my book, The Ethics of Money Production, still on sale downstairs, <laughs> in chapter 11. Okay, so let's turn to Gresham's Law, the economics of Gresham's Law. Suppose we have a monetary system in which we use gold coins and silver coins. <clears throat> so these gold coins and silver coins uh, exchange are exchanged against one another at some market rate. If we look at the tr uh, present market rate, right, gold is about $1,600, silver is about $40. So we have a mar current market exchange rate of uh, 40 grams of silver equals one gram of gold. Grain or ounce is always the same thing, right? That's so weight units are in a fixed exchange rate. As it's not fixed, right? That, that's their market exchange rate. Now, um, in, in such a system, we, we, in such a case, we speak of parallel currencies, and in more uh, recent parlance, we could also talk about currency competition. Right? Both monies are being used competitively. Market participants are free to uh, bring about their exchanges either with the help of gold coins or of silver coins, and they will do this based on, for example, the physical uh, qualities of these metals. Uh, silver coins have a lower purchasing power, therefore they are more suitable for day-to-day -day exchanges. Gold coins have a much higher purchasing power, therefore they are more suitable to bring uh, money or wealth from the U.S. to Europe or the other way around. These days it's probably from Euro uh, the U.S. to Europe or to, well, maybe not to Cuba, but some, some other places. Well, so what happens now if the government comes and imposes a legal exchange rate, so it says uh, different from from the one. Let's say, for example, the government says, well, silver henceforth shall be our legal tender. Everybody, for settlement of, it, of money that he owes, has to accept silver coins. He does not have to accept gold coins, but he has to accept silver coins. So if the initial contract has been made in silver, that's all good and fine, that the law doesn't change uh, what's actually going on. But uh, if the initial contract has been made in terms of sil in, uh, gold, a payment of gold has been stipulated, for example, uh, I, I owe uh, one ounce of, of gold, uh, then I could um, um, now pay back, uh, settle my debt with a payment of 20 ounces of silver. So on the market, my debt is worth 40 ounces of silver. The law authorizes me to pay back 20 ounces of silver, even though I owe one ounce of gold. So what shall I do? If I'm an egotistical person, well, I probably will settle in terms of, of silver. Right? And what will be the consequence? Well, the consequence will be that henceforth, no more contract will uh, stipulate a payment in gold because uh, the, the debtor can always um, claim the legal tender laws in his favor and then pay back the debt that he owes in gold in terms of a uh, sum of, of silver that has a minor uh, value. So, um, as a matter of fact, then, the, the consequence will be that gold will be driven out of the market. All payments, henceforth, will be made exclusively in terms of silver. Where will the gold go? Well, it will either be hoarded, dug into the ground, hidden in some places in the house or something, or typically, more typically, sent abroad, right? Sent uh, to other regions of the world where this legal tender law does not apply. So the co consequence then is, oh, well, well, you can also consider the, the, uh, the inverse case, right, in which we say, well, the exchange rate is, uh, the fiat exchange rate is, is uh, 60 to 1. Right? In this case, then, um, we, have, we have the opposite, right? The market exchange rate is 40 to 1. So it's now the opposite. It's uh, advantages for a debtor who has a debt in silver to settle this debt in gold. For example, let's say I have a debt in, uh, in silver of uh, 120 ounces of silver. And on the market, this, these 120 would be worth three ounces of gold. Now I can claim the legal tender law in my favor and say, well, I will pay you two ounces of gold. Right? So the consequence is in such a case that well, gold will make its comeback, 
and silver will be driven out of the market. Now, um, we see, therefore, that the definition of a fiat exchange rate um, makes that uh, only in the precise case in which the fiat exchange rate is identical with the market exchange rate will it not affect the market at all. In all other cases, such a system um, uh, in which we define a, a fixed exchange rate between uh, two uh, commodity monies, which in the case of gold and silver is then called bimetallism, in all other such cases, either one uh, uh, silver will dominate the market or gold will dominate the market. So we, uh, legal exchange rates uh, uh, create a system of bimetallism. And bimetallism in practice does not mean that both metals circulate on the market at a fixed exchange rate, but it, uh, it effectively means that I, one of them will dominate. So we have a system of alternating uh, monometallism. In the 19th century, uh, we could observe this in several countries. For example, in, in the United States, the United States in uh, 1792 uh, fixed a legal exchange rate between gold and silver that um, overvalued um, silver. So it was more advantageous for debtors to make all payments in silver. So gold was crowded out of the uh, US market and silver came to dominate the, the circulation. And then in 1834, there was a, another law, the, the Coin Act of 1834, which did the opposite, which now overvalued, which changed the uh, fiat exchange rate between gold and silver and overvalued gold. And so it was the exact opposite, when silver uh, started disappearing from the market and gold came to dominate the exchanges. So this, is, this phenomenon is called Gresham's Law, but now let's uh, look how to formulate this law precisely, according to one very uh, widespread, very famous uh, formulation, uh, it's, uh, Gresham's law means that bad money drives out good money. And this is the formulation given by Irving Fisher, uh, as an American economist, he was working at the end of the 19th and the early half of the uh, 20th century. So what is the, the bad money? The bad money is the, the overvalued money. Right? In our, our previous example, and, uh, silver was overvalued later than what gold was overvalued, overvalued as compared to what? As compared to the, mar the value it would have on the market. And so if silver is overvalued, it is the bad money that drives the good money, the undervalued money, gold out of the market. Now the problem with this formulation is that it makes no reference to the legal interference that occasions, in fact, this phenomenon. In fact, Fisher has been unfortunately very influential in conveying the notion that bad money drives good money out of the market under all circumstances. It's always the bad money that drives out the good money, which is a counterintuitive result, right? Usually in, in all markets, it's the good products that survive in the competition against bad products. We don't buy the worst cars, right? You, you don't go after the lemons and, and so on, uh, but we try to buy good cars. And we don't uh, try to buy the, the most ugly ties. I, I, sometimes we go wrong, but we try to buy the most beautiful ties, and so on. So it's always the bad, better product that drives the, uh, uh, the worst product out of the market. So according to Fisher, then, and according to the definition that he has given of Gresham's law, in money, it's the other way around. It's a completely different universe. And that's the reason why we cannot have a free market in money production. If we permitted a free market in money, and the bad product would always drive out the good product. So, unfortunately, help is available. Our friendly government takes the charge, monopolizes the money production, therefore prevents that the bad money drives out the good money. So we have bad money from the outset, probably, right? So, I mean, this formulation is wrong, right? So we, uh, what would be a, a correct formulation of Gresham's law? It would be that legally overvalued money drives out legally undervalued money. Or, in another formulation still, bad money drives out good money under fiat exchange rates. Okay. Gresham's law is a law of monetary interventionism. It's not a law of the free market. It's not a law that characterizes a phenomena occurring uh, in, in a competitive economy. economy. 
By the way, Gresham's law is uh, so-called after uh, Sir Thomas uh, Gresham of the, it was a financial agent of uh, Queen Elizabeth I in the, in the 16th century, and um, he wrote to her uh, regular market reports, and in one of these reports, he described this phenomenon. The phenomenon uh, was known before uh, Gresham. Uh, it was known in the 14th century by Nicholas Oresme, whom I've already mentioned in one of my previous talks. It was also known already in antiquity. But it's been called, in the as from the 19th century, a British uh, historian of economic thought called it Gresham's Law because he ignored the previous occurrences. And so this is Gresham's Law. Um, and as opposed to Gresham's Law in a free market setting, when there are no fiat exchange rates, then good money drives out bad money. Uh, just as any other good product would drive a bad product of the same type out of the market. <clears throat> so let's see now how this applies, how this law applies in different settings. First setting would be the production of coins, uh, precious metal coins, and we can see here how monetary interventionism, uh, legal tender laws, ruin, in fact, the coinage. So let's consider again the first scenario in which we have a uh, silver uh, currency, uh, silver coin circulation. These here, by the way, um, are um, uh, Mexican coins of the, of the 18th century. So these are the uh, eight uh, ocho reales, right? so the, also called the, the pieces of eight. Uh, in other words, the, the dollars, right? what has been called in the United States dollars. So we have a coin circulation, and uh, in such a case, the, the market ex, uh, exchange ratio, so to say, between different coins is one to one, right? One <laughs> dollar is exchanged against another dollar, and you see already that the word exchange rate is somewhat awkward in this, uh, in this context, because, I mean, the, the, the two, two coins of the, of the same type are held to be the same, right? So we have a coin system which the exchange rate, in fact, corresponds to, to the weights uh, contained in the different coins. And a coin is nothing else but uh, a certified amount of, of precious metal. Right? So it's, it's, a coin is precisely, is the, the definition of a coin is precisely that it certifies this contains, uh, whatever, uh, 30 grams of, of pure silver. Right? And if it's, there's another coin of the same type, then it certifies exactly the same thing. This coin, too, contains exactly 30 grams of silver. So the exchange rate, by definition, then is one-to-one. -one, right? And that's also what we do in our exchanges. Right? We always take one dollar being equal to another. Now, uh, something ugly has happened. right? Some uh, crook has introduced uh, a bad uh, type of coin. What you see here, maybe you cannot see this clearly, see it. This is, is a base metal, That's not, uh, it's not silver. There's only a silver plating here. Right? This is typically what um, coin counterfeiters do. Right? There are various techniques. This technique is one of them. You take not uh, a, a weight of silver, but some other base metal, aluminum, or whatever else, and you coat it with silver. So it looks from the outside like silver, but it contains much less silver than the real thing. Okay. So this may work for a while, and typically it's, it's detected, the fraud is detected because the metal that you use inside, the main metal has a different weight than the silver. And, uh, so you, you can, and then when there is wear, right, you also discover, wow, I mean, what, what is inside? It's not uh, the, the, the cat in the box that was promised, right? It's something completely different. Uh, and so after a while, people would find out in a, on a free market that, uh, that the actual silver contained in the plating is worth only one ninetieth of the, the silver uh, contained in a real coin. So these two coins might actually, conceivably, theoretically, might circulate on the market, but only at this exchange rate, right? So exchange at 90 to 1. And um, uh, the, the prices paid in terms of these bad coins uh, would be 90 times higher than the prices being paid in terms of the good coins. But the more probable uh, result would be that uh, as soon as people realize, OK, there are certain coins circulating in the, in the market that are not of good quality at all. In effect, OK, here we have measured, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the silver content is 1 90th of the, of the real coin. But 
how do we know it's actually 190th? It could be 150th or something, right? The plating could be reduced again and again. This is actually a quite thick plating, usually can be much smaller. So as soon as people had any suspicion that it's just a plating rather than a full body coin, they would probably not use it at all. That is, these types of coins would disappear from the market and um, the good coins in this example therefore would drive out the bad coins. Things are completely different, of course, if the bad coins benefit from the protection of the law. That is, if the government not only produces such coins, but protects them through legal tender laws. So here now they make a comeback, and the government says, you have got to accept these coins as though they were full-bodied coins. What happens now? Now we have clearly a case of Gresham's Law. The plated coins are overvalued by the law as compared to uh, the full-bodied coins. So nobody will make any more payments, right? If you have a bad coin in your pocket and, and a good coin, and you owe uh, a dollar to somebody, well, you will use the bad coin to make that payment, and you will keep the good coin in your pocket. It is, again, right, the good coins will be hoarded or eventually exported to, to, to some other place where you can uh, use them as, as their, as their uh, real value. And uh, the bad coins will come to dominate the circulation. Right? Only bad coins will rule, right? and the bad coins here then drive out good coins. This, ladies and gentlemen, was the reason why uh, <coughs> European coin systems throughout many centuries were very often in shambles. Right? It's always the same thing. And the United States was similar. Uh, George uh, Selgin has written uh, recently a book on, on uh, uh, sound money uh, in which he describes very vividly the, the conditions prevailing in the, the Brit British coin system at the end of the 19th century. Right? But this, of course, is the, the consequence then of uh, monetary interventionism. Right? Government has fixed legal tender laws for such coins and nobody has an interest in producing uh, good coins and using good coins. So you have all these more or less bad coins. And nobody knows exactly how bad they are. So uh, monetary exchanges are severely hampered. So let's make a, a few conclusions considering uh, this first case. For a few preliminary con con conclusions. So the first thing to uh, to underline is that the uh, competitive production of coins is both possible and beneficial. Right? Um, contrary to, to Irving Fisher. Uh, it's possible because uh, coin systems, in the case of coin systems of the same metal, and also in the case of coin systems of different metals. Right? You can have a, a coin system, uh, uh, for example, with, uh, uh, with uh, and I'm, if I'm the producer of, uh, of silver coins, I can say, well, my silver coins have too much of a purchasing power to really uh, make them usable for very, very small transactions when, right, in terms of present dollars, uh, several cents have to be paid. So their silver coins would be too, too big. So I propose to my customers some token coins, for example, uh, copper coins or some, some, some notes and so on, that can be converted in my, in my company uh, uh, in a fixed proportion against silver coins. Right? So you would then have a coin system. Uh, the pro competitive production of coins would be beneficial because good coins drive out bad coins, because competition is always stimulates innovation, right? new, more reliable production techniques, uh, techniques for the uh, fast and, and reliable identification of the metallic content. For example, if we today had a gold uh, system or a silver system, uh, then uh, I'm sure that coin producers would supply uh, firms, uh, retailers, with uh, instruments that uh, uh, allow for the, the fast and uh, reliable identif identification of the metallic content of, of coins and so on, right? So in order to stimulate uh, use of, of their products. And of course, also stimulates honesty because as soon as there's the slightest doubt that a coin producer is not reliable in his production, that he's kind of sometimes has a, 
has a crooky tendency and he uh, goes over to plating and so on, then people would simply not use his, his coins anymore. They would no longer use those, the, the dollars coming from producer A, but would switch over to the new cards or, or whatever of producer B. Second, as we have seen, legal tender laws ruin the coinage, let the uh, bad coins drive out good coins and uh, uh, second point to underline here is that competitive legal tender coinage now becomes impossible. Why is that? Now imagine you have uh, several producers of, uh, of coins uh, that are under the protection of legal tender laws and that may debase their coins. Let's see. Two producers, A and B. Now let's say uh, both of them now have an incentive to debase their coins. A has an incentive to, let's say, reduce the metallic content, silver content of his coins to 50%. Because he Im can impose his coins on the market as a legal tender. And he pockets the difference between what should be in the coin and what is effectively in the coin. But producer B then has an incentive to reduce the metallic content even more. That if, they, if they start with the same amount of silver, they have one ton of silver each initially, right? And then a producer A can make whatever, 1,000 pieces of, uh, 1 million pieces of, uh, of silver coins. Then producer B, in reducing the metallic content even further, let's say to 25%, he could produce twice as many coins and also impose them on the market because they are on equal legal footing with the other coins. Right? So you see the point? In fact, each producer in, under such a scenario, you have different debasers, all of which benefit from legal tender privileges. In such a scenario, there is a race to the bottom in debasement. And each of them has an incentive to reduce the metallic content of his metal as fast as possible. In fact, if he did not, what would happen? Let's say producer B keeps 75% of, of, of pure metal in his coins. Then producer A, in fact, he would try to get those coins as fast as possible from the market, melt them down, right, get the metal out of this, and produce new coins with, with a lower metallic content. So there is a race to the bottom, therefore, which means that uh, competitive uh, production of uh, legal tender coinage is, in fact, impossible. It's something that ruins the, uh, the, the, the coinage within a year or two, empirical. In fact, there were... Um, Two cases, two dramatic cases, in which the metallic content of uh, such coins in, uh, was run down to zero within a year. The first one was in uh, 1461 in um, uh, what is today Austria, and the second one in uh, 1599, 1600 in, uh, in Spain. In both cases, the, the government, as you might guess, had uh, financial difficulties, so it's not an exceptional situation that we confront today in the U.S., right? so they run out of money, and uh, so in, in, in its despair, the, the king in question offered to several of his uh, fellow noblemen uh, legal tender laws on coin production. It was a very profitable business before, so the king was the exclusive owner of all the, um, the coin production facilities of the mints, and then he, so to say, sold this uh, legal prerogative to other people. So in the case of the, uh, the emperor in 1461, he sold this uh, to the archbishop of, of Salzburg and to uh, two or three counts around Vienna. So you had in, within one area, you had several guys producing legal tender coins, the legal tender pennies, in fact. <laughs> and they very f uh, quickly realized the logic of the game, so each of them was debasing as fast as possible because that's the only way to gain market share right, in such a context. So they ruined the, um, uh, the coinage in no time. So, so, uh, and that is the, the true reason why uh, coinage uh, was monopolized uh, during uh, all the, the, the Middle Ages, namely because those coins were always legal tender coins and were debased. You cannot run a debased coin system with competitive legal tender producers. It's impossible. So whenever it happened, it happened only because the government was in a desperate financial situation and preferred having some money immediately now to carry on a war, to finish a war, to, to make peace or whatever, uh, uh, and uh, therefore paid the price of 
uh, destruction of the monetary system. The third conclusion is uh, that the, and this is an important uh, point, that the debasement of legal tender uh, coinage entails fiat deflation. And this is important, an important phenomenon to understand uh, the, the role of fractional reserve banks, and the emergence of fractional reserve banks. Debasement by its very nature is a time-consuming process. What do you need to do? You need to collect the old coins, melt them down, and then produce new coins with a lower metallic content. This takes time. So if a government, in order to finance its expenditure, sets out on, on debasement, it cannot do this from one day to another. And it has to engage in this time-consuming process, which typically takes, I mean, depending on the area, if the King of France did this, well, then it took a, a couple of months. A, a count in, in some, some German principality uh, that was small might have done this in a couple of uh, days or a couple of weeks. But in any case, it's a time-consuming process. So what does this mean? It means uh, that, that during this time, when people realize, wow, oh, listen, listen, new coins are coming, so new bad coins are coming, the good old coins will be uh, melted down, and so on. So what do they do? Uh, well, they, they start hoarding their old coins. Right? And start hoarding the old coins or export them. Try to escape the law as far as possible. Now, this means in practice, then, that um, the amount of money in circulation diminishes, right? The money supply, uh, excuse me, the demand for money increases, so the amount, the aggregate, uh, aggregate spending within that economy diminishes. Right? So we have here a case of fiat deflation, right? a dramatic reduction of the price level resulting from government interventionism. So it's a bad kind of inflation, uh, deflation, right? So, uh, the day before yesterday, I was talking, was uh, saying to you that deflation is beneficial in virtually all cases, and said in virtually all cases, uh, some cases where it's not beneficial, but this is a case where it's not beneficial. Right? It's precisely because it's not a result of the market process, but uh, a result of institutionalized violence. So what does happen now uh, we, so we have problems for all debtors in the country. Well, I guess who is the biggest debtor? Well, it's traditionally the government. Right? So financing itself through the debasement of the coinage has significant disadvantages from the government's own point of view. Right? As we have already seen, from an aggregate point of view, eventually, okay, it changes ownership and so on. Even in that case, deflation it does not really paralyze the economy for all times. But the, the point is, it has significant disadvantages from, uh, the, for the government. And by the way, this applies not only to uh, the case we were just considering, where we have uh, coins of different qualities, but it also applies to the case of, of bimetallism. Right? Same thing uh, that go, goes on. Right? If the government imposes uh, legal tender laws in favor of silver, right, then the gold will disappear from uh, circulation, so there will be pressure on the price level, there will be trouble in store for the government. It's even worse if the law benefits gold as compared to silver. And the reason is that it's worse because gold in the actual daily exchanges plays a much minor role. If gold benefits from legal tender laws that overvalue it as compared to silver, and then silver will leave the market. But what will take silver's place? You cannot buy a cup of coffee with a gold coin. Well, I don't recommend that you try. You have to buy many, many cups. There are a whole batch of, of coffees. You have to throw a party right? I mean, you know, to, you, to use a, a gold coin. So you cannot use these for, for small transactions. Impossible. So it follows there from therefore. So what can take the place? In actual practice, what took the place are fractional reserve banks. Because fractional reserve banks, if they have the right to issue small denominations, can fill in the gap left by the money that disappears from the market. So legal tender laws apply to coinage, bimetallism, but also coin systems and so on, was a shot in the arm for fractional reserve banking. It came to play out fully uh, starting from the 17th century. 
But uh, legal tender laws promote fractional reserve banking also in a more direct way. And that's what we will consider now. Um, oh, wait, 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 stop, 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 stop. <laughs> I need to, <laughs> I, well, I need to uh, co co conclude on, on the coinage. Uh, right, so the question then is, if we have all these negative consequences, why do we impose legal tender law to coins? And the, the standard line that you hear from governments is that these such laws protect the citizens against bad coins, but it's, uh, I don't need to go into detail to explain to you guys that the best protection is in fact the competitive production process, right, which benefits the production of good coins. Uh, a more realistic assessment, that's something that we also hear from official sources, it, that uh, legal tender laws protect businessmen against the vagaries of the market. That was the main argument advanced to justify uh, bimetallism, right? fixed, ex fixed legal exchange rates between gold and silver coins. Because in the absence of such fixed legal exchange rates because, uh, between uh, these coins, uh, there was some uh, market risk right, for entrepreneurs buying factors of production, for example, in terms of silver and selling, them, uh, selling their products uh, against gold payments. So you had a, a market risk here. But again, <laughs> this is certainly not the... Uh, from an aggregate point of view, this is not, uh, is not uh, necessary to put, uh, protect uh, special interests, right? Businessmen can protect themselves against this through adequate uh, speculation. A more uh, pertinent explanation why legal tender loans were applied to uh, coins uh, was to say, well, that it, they, this uh, technique allowed, was boiled, in fact, down to a hidden default. Right? The government, henceforth, could pay back debt in terms of bad coins, that is, while it took out a debt of, let's say, one ton of, of silver, uh, imposing silver-plated coins that could be used to pay back debt allowed the government to pay back only 200 kilograms uh, of, uh, of silver. So it was, on fa in fact, defaulting on its debt. And as I've told you already, right, the, the consequence was then promotion of fractional reserve banking, which might actually have been also um, a motivation of such legal tender coins, but this is very speculative uh, and uh, results from debasement in bimetallism. Right, so the bottom line is the bottom line is right that in fact legal tender laws are instrumental in promoting an increase of government spending. Right, they allow the government to take out more money of the market than the citizens. Uh, pay in the form of taxes. So now let's uh, turn to the uh, ways in which fractional reserve banking has been promoted more directly through legal tender laws. Again, basic scenario is the following. We have an initial uh, coin system in which exchange rates, uh, so-called exchange rates, are defined by, by weights. And uh, now we have uh, fractional reserve banks. And right? so uh, they, they issued notes. And I have here a very interesting note. This is a note of the Royal Bank of uh, Scotland. The Royal Bank of Scotland is not a central bank, but it still issues notes. And in fact, only, is, only in Scotland, Scotland is the only country left today in which private banks may issue banknotes. In fact, there are three uh, private banks that use this, this right that the law gives them. One is the Royal Bank of Scotland. Uh, second one is the Bank of Scotland. <laughs> the third one is uh, Clithworth or something. Like that. I forgot the, the exact name, right? So they issue notes. We have here the Royal, uh, Royal Bank of uh, Scotland. So the, the difference between such a note and a Bank of England note is the following. This note is uh, a money substitute. That is, it is in fact, um, uh, it's a, a fractional reserve bankers would say the uh, a legal document promising, uh, representing the promise to pay in terms of base money. So the Royal Bank of Scotland redeems these notes in terms of uh, Bank of England notes. Uh, Bank of England notes are the base monies, money in the proper sense within Scotland. Right? And these are money substitutes, just as a checking account, as a check would be a money substitute. It gives the, the owner the right to claim at the bank, a payment in terms of base money. So the Bank of Scotland issues, among other things, one pound notes. And these one pound notes then 
Not today, but in former times, could be used, could be redeemed against base money. And uh, so today it would be a redemption against the Bank of England note, but during the times of the gold standard, they could be redeemed against a gold coin of the same denomination. So we have here a sovereign, uh, the standard British count, uh, which has the denomination of one pound. So of course, uh, today, right, so the, the purchasing power of, uh, of, of a pound is about one thousandth of the purchasing power of the gold contained in the uh, no, excuse me, it's, it's, it's not 1,000, it's, it's, a, little, it's, a, it's a, little, a little more, but only a little more uh, than what we find. It's about 1 250th of what is <laughs> contained in a, uh, in a sovereign. Okay, so we now have a competition uh, between um, the banknotes and the coins. Market participants can use the banknote or can use the coin to make their payments. Uh, what are the factors that determine their, their choice? Well, what is important is that, of course, in the case of banknotes, there's a default risk. The bank might actually default, might not be able to pay back. The risk might not be very high, but it's, it's there, and in the case of uh, the, the coin, it does not exist. So this means then, in, in practice, uh, that uh, banknotes would play a subordinate, a very subordinate role within the market economy. It's a matter of convenience and so on especially when high, higher denominations are involved, right? it might be more convenient to pay 200 pounds right, with, with a banknote rather than uh, with a coin, right? you come up and you have to carry all these coins around. So, uh, therefore, people would use uh, banknotes in such cases, but in most cases, actually, they would use the coins. Things are different if the law imposes a legal equivalence, that is, if it makes the, uh, the banknotes legal tender because then the default risk does not matter. Even if the bank is not able to, to redeem uh, its notes, you still have to accept them. Right? So you don't consider, the, you just consider the, the convenience. And in that case, then gold disappears from the market. So we can cl conclude on uh, uh, these, uh, uh, on Gresham's law in, in this context, That uh, legal tender, I got lost here. Okay, legal tender, uh, uh, fractional reserve tickets, dry, media drive out coins. Right? They drive out um, bad coins, they drive bad coins out of the market, but the point is that they also drive out good coins. So the uh, bank issued money comes to dominate the market. And banks become uh, the center of the entire monetary system. So this explains the transition from uh, debasement to fiduciary media. Right? In fact, uh, in, in the case of debasement, we have seen the big disadvantage is that it entails uh, a fear deflation, right? and which hurt the government. No such thing exists in the case of an increase of uh, banknotes that are issued. Right? You issue an additional banknote, that does not mean the people, I mean, even if people now start hoarding uh, their, their gold, right, you can substitute very fast, right, in, uh, in, in no time, you can substitute additional fiduciary media to the place formerly taken by precious metal coins. Right? So the problem that we confronted in the case of metallic coin systems disappears. So there's no fiat deflation, and it's therefore less disadvantageous for the government. A second advantage is that competitive legal tender fractional reserve banking is possible. A case is the Italian banking system in the 19th century. But the, our assessments are, of course, different if we regard the same thing from an overall point of view. Right? So there are distinct ad advantages from the point of view of the government. Uh, no such uh, similar advantages uh, from the point of view of uh, the citizens as a whole, right? We still have the fact that 
these legal tender laws encourage greater production of money than otherwise would have taken place on the market. And so the Cantillon effects come into play, right? The first users of the additional money benefit at the expense of, of later users. And so it's ultimately, it's, a, it's an advantage that obtains for some uh, sectors of the economy related to the government at the detriment of all other sectors. And then, of course, the other question is, do we really get better money here? Well, in fact, as we have seen, it's not the better money that drives out the good money. It's the worse money that drives out the better money. Because the coins do have a default risk. And still, they come to dominate the market precisely because they are inferior, namely because the law imposes them on equal footing with the good money. So we can explain the transition from debasement to fiduciary media has not resulted from greater efficiency of bank-issued money, but from legal tender laws. Okay, now I need to speak very fast, right? I mean, but it's a storyline that you know already. Uh, we just need to explain how the, the transition from a fractional reserve banking to fiat money, and the, the, the basic, uh, the basic uh, consideration here is that fractional reserve banking systems are inherently instable. Right? They are fragile. And because there is an incentive for each fractional reserve bank to issue as uh, uh, many fiduciary media as possible because that's how banks earn interest income. Right? But by issuing more fiduciary media, banks become more vulnerable, right? they become more fragile, uh, and so there might be a natural balance somewhere, but the, the natural balance is, uh, that would preserve on a market, exist on a market economy is disrupted here because uh, the legal tender laws actually uh, encourage banks uh, to go on with their, with their issues. So uh, as, if then there is a, a banking crisis, this will have negative repercussions uh, for the economy because then again there would be a deflationary a correction of the market, and this would hit all debtors, and in first line, of course, the government again. So the government has an interest in preventing a meltdown of the fractional reserve banking system. How do we do this? Well, the technique that has been used historically was the creation of central banks. And the authorization of central banks to suspend their payments. That is, central banks, before were issuing banknotes that could be redeemed into a metallic base money. And the government came and said, well, look, I mean, if things are really going bad and you cannot redeem anymore, well, we authorize you to suspend your payments. As you, you don't have to redeem your notes. And this authorization, this legal act, then completely changed the monetary system. Whereas before we had a metallic base money, henceforth, thanks to the suspension of payments, we obtained a fiat money system, or more precisely, if, uh, an immaterial uh, fiat money system. And this allows then to uh, go, well, to, to overcome uh, any liquidity problems. The, the problems that we have in our today crisis are not liquidity problems. Central banks can produce as much money as we can think of. Right? The problem is that we have uh, created a huge solvency crisis. It's a different issue. Right? But again, so the main point is then that the transition from uh, the traditional monetary system based on metallic metal to a fiat money system has not resulted from the greater efficiency of the immaterial uh, money, but from the fragility, uh, the crisis proneness of the fractional reserve banking system. So we can con conclude then uh, in, uh, in, well, I won't switch over to this, this slide, conclude in, um, uh, in three points, first by, by stating again that uh, until the 17th century, virtually all countries had a monetary system based on silver. Uh, banks played virtually no role in these systems. Second uh, fact is that today all systems have a monetary system featuring uh, immaterial fiat money and fractional reserve banking. And that the reason for this transition is that inflationary legal tender laws, when they apply to fiduciary media and immaterial money, are less disadvantages for the state. That's really what it boils down to. The traditional monetary system has been abandoned because manipulating this monetary system entailed greater short-run disadvantages for the governments that were concerned. And the consequence has been, the historical consequence has been uh, an alliance between government and 
bankers, a long-standing alliance, which now dates back to the 17th century, uh, not based on personal friendship, but on the, on the logic of the monetary system. Uh, and of course, the redistribution through inflation has been great, dramatically increased. Right? I mean, you can rob the population by a debasement of the coinage, but you cannot rob it as fast and as, <laughs> as thoroughly as by the increase of uh, fiduciary media and of fiat money. And it finally is, has entailed an ever-increasing fragility, in particular, of our financial system. And the fruits of this we see today. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>